Yep, it's true. My trusty Dell PowerEdge D110 has just died on me. This is the NAS build I did a while back for only $70, but now it has finally given its last breath. It might be a bit dusty, but by far not as bad as I had expected. You might know me a bit by now, but to just give up and let it be, it's not something I'd normally do. This build has been with me through a lot, so let's see if with some simple troubleshooting we can bring this bad boy back to life. Plugging in a monitor, keyboard and a mouse seemed to me like the first good step. At least we can see what happens when we turn it on. Does it hang on something? Does it still boast and just simply throw an error on the TrueNAS install? Who knows? But even after plugging in a monitor, keyboard, a mouse and just trying to start it, restart it a few times, nothing would show up on the screen. Really nothing, just stay blank. I've even removed the CMOS battery, removed some memory, plugged it back in, nothing. Really nothing happened. So I actually decided it's time to give up. This server, although it has been with me through a lot, will not be stable if I manage to bring it back I'd say. So yeah, maybe it's time for something else. Now, any NAS install will always need storage. For that reason, I will remove the current drives that are in here to bring them with me to my next NAS. NAS stands for Network Attached Storage, and that is exactly what I will be using it for. Nothing special, just a simple location where I can store all my data as I'm kind of a data hoarder. So we got our four 2TB drives out and our trusty 60GB SSD, which we won't need anymore as this video is proudly sponsored by QNAP. QNAP is a great brand for network attached storages and were nice enough to send me this, the QNAP TS464, which is a 4 bay NAS as it says on the box but actually supports up to 6 drives, 4 times a 3.5 inch hard drive and also 2 times an NVMe hard drive. Well, NVMe SD of course. This particular model comes with 8GB of memory, a dual GBE ports, PCIe expansion slot as well as a N5095 quad core processor. Honestly, this packs plenty of power for the stuff I would like to do with it, using it as a network attached storage. Simply unboxing this already shows me an amazing difference between my previous TrueNAS system. Look how small this device is, such a big difference compared to the old server, the Dell PowerEdge D110 that I used before. Also, I don't know about you guys, but look at this nice little sleek design. This is the kind of device that would look nice just on your desk instead of a big bulky server that I had before which honestly was better hidden away in a closet. I really like also how the gold stands out with the glossy black on the side. What do you guys think? Do you agree? Please leave me a comment. And while you're at it, why don't you hit that subscribe button as well, this will really help out my channel. This NAS comes with these plastic drive brackets, which you can simply click the hard drive into. As it doesn't come with much rubber apart from around the screws, we can expect quite a bit of sound from the drives while they're in use. But then again, the server I used before would non-stop make a lot of sound, so this is for sure an improvement on that. If you don't like the noisy drives, I'd say opt for SSDs instead. They're a bit more expensive than the cheaper HDDs that I will be using, but then again, you will not have any noise and actually use less power as well. Looking at this device, I'm just extremely grateful that QNAP wanted to sponsor me on this video. Thank you QNAP, you really helped me out a lot here. On the back of the device, we can see two network ports, which are two gigabit as well, as several USB ports and an HDMI port. As I'd already said before, the device comes with an Intel Celeron N5095 quad-core processor, which supports up to 2.9 gigahertz. Aside from that, we also saw on the back that it had an HDMI port. This port actually supports 4K up to 60Hz, a great move here from QNAP I'd say. When all the drive brackets are out, we can actually easily see all the hardware that's in there as well as that it makes it very easy to upgrade. You can simply pop the NVMe drives in here, after which you can click the brackets back into place. Oh, and of course as you saw, the memory is there as well. Simply unclicking it, clicking new memory in there makes it extremely easy, you don't even need a screwdriver for any of this. How handy! But hey, enough talk about the design, let's pop our drives in there and see if setting this NAS up is as easy as I think it will be. Let's find it out. Now I'll be honest here, sometimes you see people cut out the parts where they figure out how to use such brackets. I actually thought that would take you all along, and of course, as you can see, I did not read any manual and just winked it. But hey, at least you can see that it was actually fairly easy to figure out. You just bend a little bit, pop a little bit, and hopla, it's in there, nice. Let's put all the drives in there so we can actually start this thing up. Okay, now that we got our drives in, we can actually put the front back on. I love this toolless design here. 
Nothing has to be done with screws, not even making use of the NVMe slots that I showed you earlier. Now we can actually start the fun part, setting this bad boy up. On the side of the NAS, it comes with a handy sticker with a QR code, which you can simply scan with your phone and directs us straight to the service portal to start the setup. But then again, before we start the setup, it might actually help to turn the device on. Let's test out as well if it makes a lot of noise or not. Okay, that's basically silent. Cool. Now to start the setup, I went to the page as described. Here, the setup was actually completely straightforward. Apologies for this being in Dutch, by the way, at least in the beginning, but it automatically picked up the language of where I'm located. Now, by simply clicking Cloud Install, it immediately found my NAS, as you could see. How smooth was that? Didn't even need to check what IP it had or anything. Cool. Now, here we can simply log in with our QNAP ID and password, after which we can name our NAS. Naming the NAS in here, I actually found out that the names have to be unique. I guess we'll have to use another name than I normally or basically originally wanted. Now, I'm quite paranoid with these things, so apologies for blacking out some stuff. But hey, rather be safe than sorry, right? After we've filled this all in, we have to agree to the terms of use. Make sure to read this very carefully so you don't become what was portrayed in that South Park episode, if you know what I mean. Then a quick check for update to ensure that we're running the latest version before we can continue. Starting off with the latest and greatest version is always the best start in my eyes, at least the way I see it. Apart from using FortiGate. A few minutes later. Okay, now that we're here, we can immediately see the message anonymous access denied. That's a good start if you ask me. We wouldn't want everybody to be able to just immediately access our NAS, right? We will simply log in here with our previously created username and password. And with that, we will quickly gain access to our NAS. And with that, we now have access to our NAS. It does require some additional checks to be set, but after that, we're all good. The menu of the QNAP is actually really nice, and it comes with some pre-installed apps as well. However, now that we're in, one of the first things we have to do, of course, is set up our drives. However, it doesn't stop us, of course, from first having a quick glance through the app center of QNAP. Scrolling through this gives me immediately ideas of what else we could use this QNAP for. Way more than just as a network attached storage, I'd say. We could use this media center, we could run our VPN through it. What else can we do? Wow, the options are endless, really. And yeah, I believe even we can run virtual machines on this. Let's give it a go and install Ubuntu Linux Station on this. Now that this is installing, we can also open up a little box in the bottom, or well, more expanded, to see that it's actually running the commands like we normally would. Well, actually, now you might be wondering, how can this be installed without the drives actually being available already? Well, that's because they might have missed up the timeline here. Sorry, this install is running after I had already set up the drives, but let's just pretend like this isn't a screw up from my side. Now that we're in the file station, you can see that I had already set up the drives as well that I had created the share. This share is the way I will mainly use the drives, as this will be used as a network attached storage, of course. You can see here I'm playing around a bit with the folders, just to see where do I create them, how do I make them, where do I put them, yeah, how does it work? Yeah, basically, it's just, yeah, how do you say that for toddlers? It's like a, you, you play to learn, I'd say. Yeah, IT is the same. You just test out and as long as nobody dies, it's all okay, right? You can see that I had created the folder media server inside the folder public. Yeah, of course this isn't gonna show up in File Explorer as the name of the share, it's already in another share. But if we were to create a new share called media server, then we can ensure that it shows up as the share media server next to the public share as we saw before. This share we can simply create by clicking the dots next to the name of the volume of this that I had created before. Now that we create this here, it will quickly become available in our File Explorer inside Windows as well. While we are creating this, we can already set up the user access in the way we would like it to be. For example, if we wanted to have a few users that can only read and not write to this, we can simply set it up here. For now, let's not play around with this too much and just click further so we can start actually testing our NAS performance with these old crappy disks that I put in it. Okay, coming back to this. Honestly, there's a few things that I would like to note down. Just a simple checkbox menu makes it so easy to set up certain access. And I also like that by default, we always go here for the minimum privilege, I'd say, or least privilege, I think you call it. So by default, there's a deny instead of an allow. I really like this step, thank you. Now that the share is created, we actually can see it already in our file explorer, that went very smooth. And then next to that, we have some default folders in there. But next to that, we also have a recycling bin. This is really nice. So the moment you actually delete a file, it will arrive in a recycling bin instead of actually being permanently deleted right away, like you'd normally have for shares. Really like this step as well. Wow, it's full of cool things, this NAS. To start testing out the performance of this NAS with a file transfer, I will simply copy my previous video from my channel's project folder over to the NAS. 
The transfer here will be done with a few big files and many more small files. This makes it so that it's done as a proper test and we can actually see the performance of this copy. The NAS is directly connected to my router and my laptop is directly connected to the Wi-Fi. As we just saw, the file transfer was very smooth and was running at about 60 Mbps. It really shows that even with old disks, we can achieve quite good performance. Now imagine if we were able to have quicker disks here, we could for example put this beauty next to our PC on the desk and then just via a simple iSCSI connection run our game straight off this NAS. That way we could have a game drive for every device we have, which is then the same drive. That'd be great. Well, however, I'm really grateful for having received this NAS and thank you very much QNAP for sponsoring this video. I hope everybody enjoyed this video and please leave a like and subscribe and see you in the next one. Bye bye.